everyone. Welcome back. My name is Joanne Lloyd. I'm an architect and the content marketing manager here at Monograph. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speakers, Lucas Gray and Dina Ospa from Sharp Venture Group will be joining us. Lucas and Dina are going to be sharing with us how the team at CVG think about designing their client experience. In Monograph's latest 2021 best practice report, we saw that client satisfaction is the number one KPI that architects wants to focus on, but a lot of us don't have a robust process or system in place to really hone in our client experience. That's why I'm so excited to learn from Lucas and Dina today and welcome Lucas and Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. It's good to be here. Great to be here. I'm Dina Alspa. I am the Director of Marketing for Charette Venture Group, also known as CVG. Um, we help small to medium-sized architecture firms with um, operations, human resources, and marketing. And um, I guess we work with, the number keeps growing, but I think we're at about 36 firms <laughs> across the country, um, both architect architecture and landscape. Yeah. We also have a contract a construction firm and a couple of engineers that we've worked with in the past as well. So we totally try to um, work with the entire AEC industry. So yeah, my name is Lucas Gray and I'm a senior business consultant at CVG. Um, I also help CVG with business development, so doing outreach to architects and engineers and other AEC industry firms. Uh, I actually practiced architecture for about 15, 16 years, um, including running my own firm for about seven years where I was actually a client of CVGs. Um, as a lot of you may know, we learn a lot about design. We don't learn a lot about business. Um, so I worked with CVG to kind of understand a lot of the things we're talking about today. And now I'm joined them to hopefully share some of my knowledge with other firms. So yeah, today we're gonna to really focus on uh, designing the client experience and First, we wanted to bring up some of the, the topics that we'll discuss, but really the idea is to understand why this is important, um, how marketing is then interwoven with project management. So this doesn't end. There's no like marketing phase that ends and then you can forget about this stuff. It's all interwoven into one continuous um, process. Um, a big topic is gonna be understanding who you're talking to or who you're working with, kind of what is their um, perspective so throughout all of the work that we do, we need to start thinking about what they're, what they're experiencing and what their viewpoint is on whatever um, step in that process is. And then to talk about the fact that this isn't a linear thing that has an endpoint, that these kind of uh, strategies don't end. It continues on past the end of the project. We've broken down our presentation into five main phases. So the idea being that we have like a marketing and sales process. So this is everything that kind of leads a potential client into wanting to work with us. We then have that phase before design work starts. So this is dealing with the contract, dealing with the pre-designed services, um, research, those types of things. We then move into the design process. Um, I kind of include construction admin as part of that. And then we have project closeout and then ongoing tasks that continue beyond just the end of the project. So here we're gonna stop sharing slides because they can get a little stale. Um, we're gonna try to keep this more conversational. Um, but yeah, Dina will start by introducing the um, marketing and sales process side of the client journey. Um, I think we all think about sales as um, something that we do kind of way over here and it's not really connected to anything else. But really, that's the very beginning of how we begin building relationships. Um, and there are lots of touch points along the way. Um, I think, as Lucas said, the biggest thing is really keeping in mind what your potential client is thinking and feeling and where are they? So, I mean, even getting down to thinking about how, what are they Googling? What kind of human language are they using to find answers to questions is generally um, where people begin, as I think we all know. Um, but thinking about what platforms they might be on, um, whether that's so social media or other things, um, what are they reading? What kind of blogs are they looking at? What kind of, um, you know, even magazines um, and, uh, what do they need at all the points along the way? So I think at the beginning, we think about um, 
the simplest questions, things like even, do I need an architect? So making sure that we're putting information to educate these clients um, right out at the beginning um, is super helpful. Um, and um, also thinking about how they're feeling at each point along the way. And this might be more appropriate to residential clients, but I think at some point, um, no matter what um, type of architecture you're looking for, I think that these are valid points to consider. Um, are they worried, what are they worried about? Um, what, even what points do they get excited at and they're feeling really positive and how can we communicate them and meet them where they are? Um, I think part of that is also thinking about um, both active and passive communication. So what kind of information is on our website? Um, are we offering downloads or other resources for them? Um, one example that we recently had with one of our clients was just offering a pretty simple overview, a residential client guide that they posted um, on a landing page on their website and did a very, just a 30 day long um, Google ad campaign and had great success with it. So it's sort of more proof that we should be thinking about what people are looking for at the very beginning. Um, and then along the way, um, nurturing that relationship not thinking about forgetting about outreach to them when they sign a contract or give you that yes. Um, we have one uh, firm who is about a year out before they start projects. And so how do we keep their clients engaged along the way? And so we've come up with ideas like even events, inviting them to things, you know, giving even ourselves opportunities to get to know them better before they start the design process um, and giving them homework thinking about uh, what they're going to need to know, what they're gonna need to make decisions about once we get to the design process. Um, and then of course, we go all the way into things like gifts and leave behind. So um, when CVG begins with a client, when someone says yes to us, um, we send them um, a really nice little branded Moo notebook and some cards that describe um, our community and ways that they can engage. Um, also, I think it's important to think about things that are not asks. So just things that let your clients know that you're thinking about them um, and that things that feed that relationship. So we have um, on people's birthdays or on their anniversaries, we send grateful cards, which is a really cool company and full disclosure, our founder also founded this company, but I really love it. Um, you can give say a hundred dollar grateful card to someone and it allows them to donate to a charity of their choice and people seem to really love them and they're just a little extra something that we put in front of people. Lucas? Yeah I think it's it's important to um, just reiterate that a lot of this stuff is trying to reinforce our mission vision values. Um, so grateful is something that we as CVG thinks it's important. So we're kind of showing that to our clients. And that's something that you guys should be considering as well, is that when you're kind of planning all of the various touch points with your clients, you should really be kind of reinforcing who you are, what you believe in, so you can um, resonate with the client or have the clients resonate with kind of what you, what you do. Um, so once that kind of marketing and sales process is complete and someone is said, yes, I want to work with you, um, we then are kind of dealing with the contract negotiation. And I think it's important to, to consider this as a really important part of that customer experience. This is, tends to be the more difficult conversations because we're talking about money, we're talking about services, there are legal requirements. Um, but this is also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to show how you're going to be communicating with this person over time knowing that these relationships for the, for a project could last, you know, one year to five years, maybe potentially even longer. It's important to set that uh, groundwork on how you're going to talk through um, potentially challenging issues kind of early on. Um, so being really clear about, um, you know, what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, what is included, what are the legal ramifications of everything? Um, of course, the money side of things. So explaining very clearly, you know, how you're going to invoice, how payments are made, what the timing of those are going to be. Because we really want to make sure that we're setting expectations and that the client's expectations are what we can deliver on. And I think that the biggest conflict comes when expectations aren't being met, when they think one thing, we think something else, and those two things are not aligned. So we really want to make sure that as we're dealing with the legal structure of how we're going to practice, how we're going to deliver our work, 
that we're setting the realistic expectations for that for the client. Once the contract is worked out, um, I think a big aspect of um, where a lot of firms fall short is having a really clearly defined onboarding process. And again, to use CVG as an example, um, we're currently in the process of defining this for ourselves. So whenever a new client signs with CVG, what are the initial steps? And we're always trying to improve upon those as we get new clients and learn from the past clients. But um, Dina already mentioned some of the things we do, but we send a little gift. Um, we have a welcome packet. So this is going to be um, like a document that talks exactly about how we work, who we are, who to get in touch with when, um, who's the main point of contact for your account, who's the main point of contact for billing questions, um, how schedulings get, get done, um, how we work together, what kind of meetings we have, um, what team is gonna be the team that works on your project. So at CVG, we typically have a 30 minute video call that's an introduction call where we introduce almost everyone at the company. As we grow, we can't quite fit everyone in or not everyone could attend every meeting. Um, but we wanna give you an overview of our whole team, but then we um, have most of the people leave and we have a quick like 10 to 15 minute conversation with just the people that are gonna be leading the work with that specific client. Um, we then have um, a period of time in that call where we do questions and answers. So make sure that we know what the client is concerned about, um, an opportunity for them to give us information, um, ask us questions, or we might have questions for the client. So typically um, when I was running my firm, we had like a list of 20 or 30 questions. We're in that kind of first meeting. We would always make sure that we're asking these because we need to gather that information to best serve that client going forward. And then as part of this onboarding process, we also want to give assignments to that client. Um, so again, Dina alluded to this earlier, but having clear homework that we can tell the client, you're responsible for this. We need you to go home, talk with your family and give this, this information. Or, you know, if it's a commercial client, maybe it's helping develop the um, budget or define the equipment that's going to be in that space that we need to consider in the design. But even in this onboarding process, we're trying to give some clear guidance for when we'll need feedback from the client and what their responsibility is in the process. Of course, um, once we have kind of that defined and that onboarding is complete, um, one of the major challenges or hurdles is communication, um, specifically when it comes to informational or document sharing between um, the firm and the client. So. There's a bunch of different ways to do this, um, but I, again, I want you guys to think about how you're designing the client experience. So thinking about how you're sharing your work from the client's perspective. Is it easy for them to find the latest edition? Is it easy for them to give comments or feedback? Um, will it get lost in a big chain of other messages? So for instance, if you're relying on Slack, is Slack the best platform to share the latest design drawings. Um, maybe there's something else. Um, for instance, I really don't think email is the most appropriate way to send um, information because A, it gets archived or it gets lost, it's harder to find, or you might get in the situation where you've sent two or three versions of something to different people and you're not sure what the most recent uh, version is. One of our firms um, has developed a really great um, tool that I think could be emulated by almost any firm um, but they actually use Google Sites. So it's a free platform. You basically are creating a little mini website for each of their clients. And that website they use as the primary form of document sharing for their um, project. So they'll share all of the drawings. They'll make sure the most recent one is dated and uploaded. They can actually have clients open the PDF within that site, add comments to that sheet and it's dynamic. So multiple people could be commenting at the same time. Um, it was a really... Um, unique and effective way, I thought, for how they were communicating a lot of their work with with their clients. That's just one example. Like um, Evelyn and others have talked about earlier, there's an entire you know software suite that could do similar things. But finding the right tool to really make this a streamlined and simple process for the clients is going to be important. Um, and then taking it the, ne the next step is there's going to be a series of touch points where you are interacting with the client and their team and other people, other stakeholders in that project. 
So making sure you're designing how you're going to do these things. So for instance, site visits, there's going to be people from your team going to the client's property, um, home, business, whatever. Um, so you need to understand what they might be concerned about when your team is there. What are you going to wear? How are you going to speak to both the client? How are you going to speak to potential their employees or their family members? Um, how do you make sure that you treat their property with respect? Um, you don't do anything that's going to you know, create a mess or damage or disrupt their business. Um, there might be situations where that's inevitable, but at least doing it in a way that's very minimal. So you're, again, showing them that you care about their um, point of view. So th that kind of is the overview of the pre-design. Um, what I would say is, you know, before you're actually doing the work, it's gathering the information, it's how you're going to share, it's how you're going to communicate kind of what your expectations are of the client and then sharing um, kind of what you're going to do so the client has clear expectations of the rest of the design process. So now I want to like to talk about kind of what the uh, key um, touch points are throughout the design process. And I think it's important to remember that, um, again, George alluded to this in his introduction uh, conversation, but we speak in a different language. Um, we use architectural words when we're talking to each other. We tend to be trained to present to other architects through our education and even in um, our early careers where we're presenting within our firm. But really tr making sure that we are starting to think about how we are going to communicate our design process to the client in a way that they understand um, what we're saying and what we're doing. This all starts um, by giving a really clear introduction of who the project team is going to be. So there could be a, most likely up until this point, the client has been speaking to a few specific people at the firm. It might be a, you know, a principal of the firm. It might be the business development director, but it's going to be probably people more in senior leadership and probably people who might not be doing the actual work. So when you're dealing with contracts, um, you're probably talking about certain things, but then when the work starts, you're going to transition into a different team that's gonna probably be the primary point of contact. So making sure there's a process to introduce those people, who's gonna be working on this project on a day-to-day -day basis, and then introducing or finding a way to kind of hand off the baton to the person who's gonna be leading the conversation. So is the client always gonna be calling the principal if they have a question, or should they be calling the project manager or the project architect? So making sure you know who that, so the client knows who they should be talking to, who they should be asking questions, and who, who's the right person who has the most information. Because even though the client might want to talk to me as a partner, they, I might not know because I'm not working on that project on a day-to-day -day basis. Being very clear and transparent about what the project schedule is. So I think Monograph um, is trying to build this within their software, and it is a great tool that I used when I was running my firm. But visualizing the schedule, um, breaking it down by phases, showing when the key milestones will be, and handing that over to the client at the very beginning. So again, you're setting their expectations. They can see when to expect certain work from you. The next side of that is you. once you've set that expectations, it's up to you. You have to deliver. Um, that's the number one way to keep clients um, satisfied, is delivering on the promises you've made. Um, Talking about meetings, um, I would, again, in these kind of early conversations, really um, set clear expectations of how meetings will be run, how long they're going to be, do whatever you can to keep them on time so you're not asking people to stay late because they're probably going to have other commitments, people are busy, um, you know, have a really clear documented process for the way you're going to manage a meeting, take notes, who's going to be at those meetings, what questions will be asked. When do the deliverables get delivered? Is it at the meeting? Is it prior so people can review? But making sure that that is a very defined process. It's communicated to your clients so they can expect, they know what to expect for future meetings and then your team knows what to expect to prepare for them. Um, at those meetings also kind of assigning homework, who's gonna be doing what, when, um, what are the next steps that are gonna happen after that meeting and when will they be delivered or what information you need from other people. Um, the other thing that I thought was really important was kind of having a defined process for transitions between phases. So we're working through schematic design. We have key milestones, let's say 50% schematic design and then 90% schematic design. 
and then we have 100% schematic design. I think that there needs to be some sort of um, acknowledgement that that phase of work has been complete for a couple of reasons here. One, it shows the client that you've completed that work. It's a clear milestone that um, they can see has been completed within that schedule you've shared previously. But then also it protects you and your, your team. So I had an authorization to proceed form that I would send um, with the 100% design drawings to each client, asking them to just acknowledge this is the scope of work that was defined for this phase. Here's the deliverable. We acknowledge that we've received the deliverable on this date. The idea there was in three weeks when they want to go back and make a change or they say, you know, in three months, hey, that was never discussed or we never... Um, finalize that decision, we have a documentation that that did happen. Um, and I want to make sure that I can protect my team as part of this process. The other um, kind of antidote that I would uh, highly recommend everyone start implementing tomorrow would be, I always hated when the client was the first one to ask us for something. So if a client contacted me and had a question like, hey, you know, this was supposed to be due yesterday, we haven't received it yet, or when is our next meeting or something along those lines, it means that our team missed something. We didn't communicate enough with our client. So I think every firm should adopt a weekly update email where on Friday afternoon, you are emailing every single one of your clients a quick update. It might be just, hey, thinking about you, I understand your project's on hold and we're waiting for some information. I want to let you know that, you know, our team is ready, you know, when you are. It could be, hey, this is what we completed this week. Um, let's take um, some of that information and share it with the client on that Friday so they can see what, product, what projects have been done. Also, particularly for residential clients, the weekend is a time when they're probably thinking about their project, talking with their family about it. So that Friday touch-in gives them an opportunity to start um, preparing for what they might have to deliver to back to you for the next week. But it's also a marketing opportunity. And this is an opportunity where you want to have those clients satisfied and talking about you. So when they're out um, at the soccer game on Saturday morning, they the top of mind is, oh, my architect gave me an update on my house project. I want to talk about that and share that information with others. Dina, was there anything you would like to add about that last point? No, I'm just smiling. I love that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> have people saying, who's your fabulous architect at the soccer game? <laughs> yeah, and then I, I think within this, um, again, going back to the tools, there's a, a whole bunch of tools you can use. Um, a lot of these things are going to happen in person. So in-person meetings, whether they're onboarding meetings or those regular client interval meetings, um, you can phone call clients to communicate, email, of course, there's chat apps, all these things. Um, I would at least rely on at least a weekly email probably to check in um, unless you're using some other platform to communicate. Like we have Slack with all of our clients. So quite often on a Friday, I'll go through and check out what firms I've been working with this week and just follow up with any outstanding questions that, that may have come through. Um, I wanna make sure that they know that you know we're thinking about them. Yeah, emails are, are I have a love-hate relationship with emails. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so then those are kind of the key um, overviews for the design process that we control as the architecture team. Um, so that would be like schematic design through construction documents. There's a bunch of things that then happen that are kind of beyond our control. So there's a, a different way to think about this, or there might be different ways to think about this. And again, I would encourage kind of a wrap up. So part of that, um, like authorization to proceed form, um, I would do something similar when the construction documents are complete because you're moving into a different phase of work. So there's gonna be a different rhythm and a different schedule of communication with your clients. And they're gonna be, they're gonna have different expectations because the expectations that you set for how you work might not be applicable to how the permitting office works or how contractors work or how some of the consultants that would impact your project work. So you need to really, again, reset those expectations. Um, show, talk to them about how that schedule is gonna change where you might've had a very, um, you might've been able to have a rigid or pre-defined -de uh, design process 
that might not be the case when you submit your drawings to the city anymore. It can become very unpredictable, very frustrating. Um, no one knows how long these things might last, um, what questions might come up from the city viewers or from the contractor team. So making sure you're communicating, um, again, still regularly, I would still check in weekly and just say, hey, we're still waiting in on this information from this um, person. But um, a lot of this is gonna be out, outside of your control. So you have to really think about what that client might be worried about and making sure that you're communicating or addressing that. I would also be very clear about when the client will hear from you versus when they might hear from other people. So if it's during the construction process, they're probably meeting with that contractor on a more regular basis, potentially than the architect. So making sure you tell them like, hey, we're gonna be here on a monthly you know, site visit, or maybe it's a weekly site visit, but very clarifying where, when you'll be the lead point of contact for, let's say um, an owner architect contractor um, meeting versus when they might you know, just ask the contractor or meet with the contractor directly. Same with other consultants, um, when there might be questions for engineers or civil or landscape or interior designers, all those other consultants really um, communicate that with the client who's kind of under your control, who's an outside contractor that might be contracted directly with the, either the, con the general contractor or potentially the client themselves. So who's um, the point of contact for different questions. Um, making sure that you're showing that you're staying present and staying engaged even throughout this kind of long drawn out process of permitting and construction. Um, you wanna make sure that you're leaving the client feeling that you've given them the attention that they need and that you don't just you know, disappear after that construction document's done. And then of course, one of the biggest challenges or concerns that clients have is the money side of things. So where's money going to who and when? So making sure that again, you're clear when your invoices are gonna be, what they're gonna include, what scope of work they're gonna include, what consultants might be included in those versus what invoices the client might start getting from somebody else. So potentially the contractor might be invoicing the client directly or some other consultants that they might've contracted with. So you don't want the, con the money to be a shock to people. That's really where most clients start getting nervous. Um, and then once that construction's complete, we wanna make sure that that's not the end, that there's a couple of um, ongoing phases. There's project closeout. So what do you do when construction ends, but there's still a little bit of work to do and um, key activities to go through. And then some ongoing things. So for project closeout, I always wanna do a walkthrough. So probably something even after the punch list walkthrough with the general contractor, but do a walkthrough with the client to kind of celebrate all the hard work that's been putting in, put into the project and the end result of that. Um, making sure that they're happy with their new home or their new business or the office for their, their, um, their firm or you know, whatever the project was. Um, get photography, um, Dina will tell you this, but it's key to document the work you've done. It's the only thing you have at the end of the day. Um, so make sure you're getting uh, professional photography done. Organize some sort of celebration or event where you can invite the client, the rest of the team. Make sure you're inviting your consultants um, to you know, thank them for all the work they put in. Make sure you can invite the client's friends or family um, if it's residential or their, um, their um, customers potentially if it's a, a, you know, a retail project or um, their community if it's a public project. Make sure you're celebrating that all this hard work has gone into that project and that the client was a key part of that. So make sure you're thanking the client and highlighting the work that they've done um, to make that, that project a success. Um, you're gonna start thinking about the publicity of it. Um, how do you credit the people that you know, worked on the project? How do you credit the client in that publicity? Um, and then make sure that you're staying engaged with the client themselves. So ask for feedback. Have a customer survey that you give at the end that says, what could we have done better? What could we learn from this experience? What did you like about how we worked? What did you not like about how we worked? Uh, we wanna use this as a way to improve for the next client that we have, the next project we're doing. So make sure that there's some sort of feedback loop that the clients can, um, can give you um, information that you can learn from. And then of course, part of that then leads into, again, the marketing side which is you want that client to leave happy 
So they're giving testimonials for your marketing materials. Um, they can refer you to other people because that's always one of the best ways of um, getting future business. I think it's um, pro it's in always interesting that almost every architect I speak with, their most of their work comes from referrals, and uh, and oftentimes that's the very group of people that we forget to continue to reach out to afterwards. So we're we're trying to do this breaking rocks work of finding brand new people when often we can just go back to the, these relationships we've already spent all this time nurturing and building, um, and have them. Just, just reminding them that you exist often can remind them to share the wonderful work that you've done with them and what kind of experience they had with you. So the last section here is kind of thinking beyond the project itself. So that, you know, you do the celebration party and you get some testimonials and you give the survey, you don't just disappear. That this project isn't over and the relationship with that client is not over. So there's important things that we think that every firm should be doing over time. So typically um, the first play two would be a six month check-in and a one year check-in. You should probably design this based on the clients you have, how you work, the type of project. But what are the key questions to ask? Um, what do you wanna um, learn at that point in time? Um, probably it's, hey, what are the growing pains moving into that space? Is there anything we could do to help um, do final adjustments. Maybe it's the mechanical system isn't calibrated correctly, or um, there's something about the building that they don't know um, that we could educate them on. So making sure that you know it's the building is functioning as as it was designed to. Uh, making sure you're getting client feedback, but also just making sure that they know that you care that um, the relationship wasn't a transactional one, but that you built um, a strong relationship personally with them, and that you care about how they're feeling about their project that your firm is um, someone that they can rely on to ask questions over time. So yeah, six months and a one year check-in at the very least, but I would have probably an annual check-in going forward. You really wanna nurture that relationship um, forever because you never know when they'll become repeat clients themselves um, or when they will uh, refer you to other people. Um, so I would always look for opportunities to reach out. So, you know, hey, I like, saw this thing in the news that reminded me of your business. It might be you know, relevant to what you're doing, or it could be little asks like, hey, how's it going? I'd love to learn about how the sustainable features that we put on your building are performing over time. So getting, finding opportunities to ask them questions about their experience in their space. Um, you guys probably know this, but basically all of this is kind of doing a post-occupancy evaluation. So I would definitely encourage everyone to have a defined um, process they go through for that. And it might be that that is split up over time, that there's one that you do about a year after they move in, but maybe particularly on some of the more high performing buildings, you might wanna check in you know, after three years or five years to kind of see how some of the strategies you use performed and also what the client has, experience has been you know, within that space. And then this is also an opportunity to offer ongoing support. So just because your contract ended on the scope of work to deliver that project doesn't mean there's not services that you can continue to provide. So start thinking about what additional services might be useful or valuable to the client that you can offer them. So it could be like, it could be an annual um, analysis of the performance of their building or, you know, um, I don't know, maybe it's interior design services as an additional scope of work beyond traditional architecture but trying to identify um, other areas where you could actually add value to that client and potentially drum up additional business from them. So yeah, um, I'm gonna ask Dina two questions here because I think these are kind of her, um, maybe some of the strategy that she talks about with her clients. But Dina, do you think that this changes based on either firm size or project type? Is there anything that you would do differently um, depending on what type of clients you're serving? Not necessarily, although I think there is a little bit different approach between um, if you're speaking to a potential residential client versus a developer. Um, there is a level of comfort I think we need to create around residential clients a lot of the time. Um, I think for, for most people, 
it's probably kind of a once in a lifetime thing. And even though we're thinking about this and doing it every day, it's probably their first time. So um, sort of alleviating fears that perhaps commercial, the commercial side doesn't have quite so much. Um, and I think on the commercial side, really demonstrating professionalism and that you you know this business well and can speak the language and that you have their best interest at heart. But overall, I think it's pretty similar. And again, it goes back to really thinking about everything from the client or potential client's perspective and trying to anticipate um, needs and wants at every stage. Great. So that's pretty much the end of our presentation. So yeah, we would love to open this up to audience questions. Looks like there's a couple in the chat. Okay, let me uh, go through the questions. Um, we had a question about how do you systemize the client experience? Do you use any automation tool? And I think this go are we together with Don's question? Can you talk about how CVG has designed their own client experience process? Yeah, so um, I'll start with the systematizing it, but I think Don's question will get wrapped into this one. Um, so we're currently using software called monday.com and we basically use it as a way to create like um, checklists for different steps in this process. So for instance, we have like a new client onboarding um, checklist that we'll actually go through. We assign different tasks to different people within the company. Um, it could be things like sending the welcome gift and welcome packet, um, scheduling the meetings. Um, so like each one of those is a check, check mark. So the idea would be that every new client that we sign, um, we then create a new board for them and then we know we can then assign who's going to be doing each thing so we don't miss anything. Um, and then we would create one of those for each kind of step in the client experience process. So there's the onboarding is an easy one, but we would probably, if I was running my architecture firm, I would create one for, you know, what do we do for the 50% schematic design milestone? And there would be, you know, a really clear, the clearly defined set of steps as well as deliverables that we would do at that moment in time. Same for um, the transition between phases or project closeout. So all of those would have kind of their own process documented in for the tools that we're using within Monday. So that's how CVG has been doing it. Um, we have kind of the Monday boards, which are like to-do lists for each of us. And then as far as the client goes, um, we have kind of two or three um, kind of steps for their onboarding. So there's the sales process, which involves a few meetings. We do an assessment. Um, I'm going to skip over that because it can get, we can describe that for a while. <laughs> Basically, once they agree to uh, that they want to work with us, um, we set up a series of introduction meetings. So I mentioned one, we have one with our whole team. We then have a second one with just the team that's going to be working with them. Um, Todd, who's our CEO, actually works with every new client for the first I want to say two months or so. Um, it's like six or seven meetings that he'll work directly with them, along with someone from our marketing team like Dina and someone from the management team like myself. So the three of us will be working with that client over that first two months of onboarding. And then we'll split up that meeting into a marketing meeting and a management meeting. So Todd will kind of take a step back and each one of us as the um, client leads would start taking on um, meetings individually. And then we try to do weekly check-ins with each other to make sure that you know we're sharing information back and forth and um, supporting each other. And then we'll bring in other people from our team as needed in the conversation. But the idea is we really wanna make it um, as transparent and smooth as possible about how they move from you know signing that contract to at least getting into the rhythm of working with us on a regular basis. I would also say these meetings give us the opportunity to tailor our services. So even though we have a system in place and we have steps, um, every step isn't perfect for every firm. And we really work hard to make sure that we're listening and that we're shifting based on the needs of each firm. And so having that framework makes it a lot easier. It's kind of like you need to know the rules before you can break them. <laughs> so having the framework allows us to fill in and make changes quickly. I like when you talk about the 
span of your meetings is not just like I think most people see client onboarding as just one meeting and you're done and the client is onboarded, but you have this two month period of really working with them one-on-one and having a a whole process. Um, I think that's very valuable. We have another question here from Jody. For very small firms and sole practitioners with limited resources who are just getting started on refining the customer experience, where do you recommend focusing on first? Um, great question. I mean, communication is by far the biggest challenge. Um, if you're communicating well and communicating regularly with your clients, even if there's a challenge that comes up or a conflict, um, being able to talk through it is going to be the first step. So the first one would be a weekly check-in would be my recommendation and find the tool that works best for you. So it could be email. If you don't like email, it could be a text message. It could be a phone call. Um, if you could communicate with Slack, like we have a Slack channel with all of our clients. So that's our primary way of communicating with our, with the people we work with, um, but really finding, um, you know, a way to communicate and do a weekly check-in with them to just check, just see how they're feeling. It doesn't have to be an update. It doesn't have to be a technical thing. Just how are you? I'm thinking about you. You were working on your project this week or, or whatever it is. But yeah, I would definitely say a weekly check-in would be the first step that I would implement. Um, Jody, you also talked about um, starting by making sure your website is clear. Would yeah. you expand that a little? Absolutely. I think that um, websites are always a challenge and um, making changes, updating things can really take a lot of time and, fr and, and creates a lot of frustration. But it's so important to know that whether it's referrals or people who are finding you for the first time, um, that's almost always the first place people land. And so thinking about making that um, really reflect who you are and, and creating a brand environment that is, um, that is differentiated from your competition, that really speaks clearly about um, your product, your personality, your point of view um, is really important. And I think um, tools like Squarespace have made this so much easier. Um, they are free to start with. And even when you launch a site, um, they're very, very reasonable. It's, you know, $216 for an entire year. I think that we often get bogged down in um, thinking we need all these bells and whistles on a website, but really what we need is information and simplicity. Um, the other thing Squarespace does very well, I see Jessica's commenting, is um, <laughs> everything is responsive and beautiful on mobile as well. And they really kind of save you for, from yourself in helping you um, create something that's gonna look great in both places, which is huge because as I look at analytics almost every day, um, almost across the board, no matter um, what category you're in, people tend to be about 50-50 coming from desktop and mobile. So they both have to look great, but things like Squarespace just make that so much easier. I agree. I use Squarespace myself for my own personal <laughs> website, so mm -hmm. it's definitely very easy. Um, we have another question from Andrew. With all the different forms of communication, how do you set reasonable boundaries with clients that both demonstrate you extra effort while protecting your personal time? Great question. This is, I think, something we're all still learning how to do. <laughs> um, I, I like to talk, I would say part of this is that onboarding. So when you're bringing a client on um, to work with you, setting those expectations up front is important. So talking about kind of what is the means of communicating. So when are you going to use what? Um, so are you going to email? Is it primarily in-person meetings? Is it primary phone calls? Whatever it is, um, explaining to them what your turnaround is. So like, hey, if you send me an email, I'll try to get back to you within 24 hours. But I'm not gonna get back to you within two minutes because I'm busy and doing other work and have other emails I need to get to as well. Um, maybe Slack, I typically try to get to any Slack message within, a, within that day. So if someone messaged me at 4 p.m., I'll try to respond before I leave the office. But I will also tell them that 
when I go home, it's my personal time. I'm focusing on other things in my life that I'm not going to respond at 9 p.m. to a Slack message or a text message or something. So just making that very clear, uh, making that part of the conversation you're going to have in that first meeting or part of the onboarding process is how you're going to communicate, how you're going to communicate different information because sending drawings is different than answering questions. Um, and then kind of what the turnaround time frame should be for them to expect you to respond. So phone call, I'll try to pick up the call or call you back as soon as possible. Email, set whatever it is. I think 24 hours is a good one. Maybe it's 48 hours um, for Slack messages or text messages. Maybe it's within you know that calendar day. I was going to say too, set yourself as a way. I think having people know that you are away and you're not just not answering them is really important. And of course, you know, CVG has always been virtual company, even pre-pandemic, but now that's true for everyone. I noticed Lucas said, you know, when you're at home, but we're all at home <laughs> all the time. So I think it's even more important to set those boundaries and that's a real easy way to do it too. Yeah. I think one thing to add there is um, it's important to set them for your clients, but also for your team. Um, mm -hmm. That within the company, you don't expect, if I message Dina at 11 p.m., I should not expect her to respond. That she has till tomorrow at some point to get back to me, not immediately. Because um, this, otherwise there is no work-life balance and that has its own, you know, issues and challenges. Yeah, I love that. At Monograph, we... Um... We also use Slack, but we have a send it later feature where if you need to jot down something at 11 p.m., you could, but you can set it to send it to your team members at tomorrow at like 10 a.m. So you're not disturbing people <laughs> when they're watching Netflix at home. Thank you so much, Lucas and Dina.